And the first lecture of today, we have Sven Hirsch working on minimal slicing and applications. All right, so the question I want to focus on today is um, which surfaces or manifolds can we positively curve? And that's our directive for a couple of examples. So the easiest example would be just the round sphere, and that would be just manifestly positively curved. But say we can deform it now a little bit. Say maybe it looks then roughly like this. Then we would get, we still have here some positive curvature and get some more positive curvature over here. But we will have also introduced here some negative curvature in the middle where we like squeeze the sphere a little bit. And the same we can, of course, do also for other topological spaces. So let's take the torus. And in this picture, we would have here on the outside a bunch of positive curvature. But then here on the inside, the curvature will be negative. And then one natural question would be, can we do a similar deformation, like to go from here to here to make the torus, for instance, positively curved everywhere? And of course, the same thing we can also ask for more complicated topological spaces, but then the situation will look very similar. <laughs> and here for this question, whether we can make the torus positively curved, therefore the answer is no, and that falls from one of my all-time favorite theorems, the ghost Bonnet theorem. <coughs> and I mentioned what curvature can I make possible? Um, that's going to be one of the main theme of um, what I'm talking today, and that, that's going to be different types of curvature, which play an important role. So the gauss bonnet theorem is basically saying if you have some surface like here and we integrate um, its curvature, in this case scale curvature, this would be just a pi times one minus the number of poles. So for instance, um, in the sphere, we don't have any holes. So the right-hand side will be positive, um, which means that we can have like every positive curvature, but also means the additional positive curvature we have introduced here will be exactly the same amount of negative curvature here. But it will then also tell us that, say, um, here in the torus, because we have one hole, the right hand side will be zero, so we'll never be able to make a curvature positive everywhere. So we get in dimension two this following table. So if we ask ourselves, where do we get positive curvature? We say we take the sphere and the torus and for these surfaces that will look very similar. For the sphere, it will be possible to have positive curvature, but then for the torus, as we've just seen from this Gospini theorem, it will be impossible to have positive curvature. Sorry, is there a reason you like positive rather than negative? Um, <laughs> <laughs> like, it's, uh, you can ask the question. It's going to be much more restricted. Um, one dimension. Positive uh, coverage is then what turns out gives you these topological restrictions. But yeah, so in dimension two, the picture is relatively nice. Um, but let's have a look at the one high dimension and dimension three. And now coming back um, to Peter's question, what will be the right type of curvature? So for instance, we can have like one curvature in, in this direction, another one in this direction. This will be then basically all the Ritchie curvature, or we could also average over all these directions, which would be scalar curvature. And we can ask then a question about positive curvature for both of these. So let's say, what about Ritchie positive or positive scalar curvature? And now let's take S3, S2 process one, and again, the torus. And now this goes for theorem is just a two dimensional result. So we need like some analog um, to address this high dimensional case. And the first theorem is basically a corollary of Bonnie Myers. And this tells us that there's no positive Ritchie curvature on M cross S1. And similarly, there's also something with scalar curvature, which was due to um, Shane Yao and Gromov Lawson. It says that there's no positive scalar curvature 
the torus. And now at this point, let I also use this opportunity to quickly mention why we should care about um, this positive curvature. I mean, intrinsically, it's very beautiful, but actually, it's also physically quite relevant, um, which we know from our former colleague, um, Albert Einstein, who was telling that matter curves space time and the curvature of space time is determining how matter moves. So basically, all these statements about geometry and curvature will have like the analog in physics. And for instance, here for this one, um, the corresponding statement will be um, Hawking singularity theorem. So it's basically the reason there's a big bang. Um, and similarly, you can also do a Penrose singularity theorem regarding black holes. And then theorem two, that there's no positive scalar curvature on a torus is the reason, um, say if I take here like some chalk that it falls like down, that has positive mass, that's precisely the reason for that. And the physical re result has been proven by Shen Yao and Edward Witten. But yeah, so now we can try to fill in this table. Again, the sphere is going to be positively curved, um, no matter which kind of curvature we choose. And then for S2 crosses one, let me draw a quick picture. So think of having like here, like a sphere across an interval where we identified opposite ends. And then you have basically positive curvature in some direction, but you also have this flat direction. But if you take like the average of it, which would be scalar curvature, it would be positive. And now we can apply theorem one and two to see that there's no positive rigid curvature on S2 crosses one. And um, no positive rigid coverage on T3, which is just T2 crosses one. And finally, theorem two tells us that there is no positive scalar coverage on T3. So we had to put in maybe a little bit more work, but we still got like a very nice picture of understanding this in dimension three. But now dimension four things actually gonna get more complicated. Um, make quite a bit actually. Um, so in this case, I want to look at now S4, S2 cross S2, S3 cross S1, um, S2 cross T2, and the torus. And now because we're like in high dimension, it will be again like even a bit more interesting to see what kind of curvatures we want to use. And let me put this, um, explain what kind of curvatures we have in dimension four. So I'll just take here some surface sigma and then say any point inside sigma. Then we can always look at these tangent vectors. So here's a one and a two, but let's do it in four dimensions. So we have two more. And then I can write like here a table of all of these tangent vectors. And then one can always look at the uh, curvature in this direction of these two tangent vectors, which is called the sectional curvature. So in this case, here in this table would be say the sectional curvature of e1 and e2. And here would be section curvature of e1 and e3, here of e1 and e4, similar here of e2, e3, e2, e4, and here e3, e4. And then when you have twice the same vector, it will always be zero. And then it's a matrix. So here you get again exactly the same. And then um, the rigid curvature is just going to be when you sum up one of these columns. Um, so it's going to be a less strong restriction on the manifold because you're taking these averages. And then if you take even more averages, the scalar curvature would be just if you sum all of them, or if you just, because of symmetry, you can also just sum these three columns which would be done one half times the scalar curvature. So let's try to fill it in for some sectional positive or positive rich curvature and for positive uh, scalar curvature. And again, the sphere is going to be positive for all of these. <laughs> then for S2 cross S2, it turns out it has positive rich and positive scalar curvature. And S3 crosses one and S2 cross T2 they have positive scalar curvature. And now we can also go to these non-existence results um, using again theorem one and theorem two. 
So we don't have positive Ritchie on these three manifolds because of this one factor. And then as we've seen, positive section would imply positive Ritchie. So we can also make an X up here. And then finally, um, on the terms, we again don't have positive scale curvature. But now we have like a much less satisfying picture as before. Um, namely, um, we still have here like a gap. And unfortunately, I'll also not be able to fill this gap. This is so-called Hopf conjecture, which is open for nearly one century. And then the other thing which is what, the, what does the conjecture say? Is it um, yeah. that there's a <laughs> positive sectional curvature metric on S2 crosses two, also for more general products, but this is like the simplest unknown case. But then the other thing is if you look at S3 crosses one, S2 T cross T2, these are like two very different topological spaces. But you see they're like exactly the same. They have positive sectional, positive Ritchie, but they don't have them, but they do have positive scalar curvature. And we would like to distinguish them by their curvature. So that raises the question, is there's another way how we could um, distinguish them? Um, but now let's look back at this picture over here. So once we summed up three columns for scalar curvature and for Ritchie curvature, we summed up a single column. So what happens if we just sum up two columns? And this will be then what is called two intermediate curvature. And then basically Ritchie would be one intermediate curvature and scalar would be in this case three intermediate curvature. And it turns out that for positive to intermediate curvature, we have it positive on S2, S4, S2 cross S2, S4, and S3 cross S1, but not on S2 cross T2 and not on T4. So basically now they behave like differently. And it's also like pretty easy to construct examples which satisfy this curvature bound by just taking standard product manifolds and also preserved on surgeries, etc. And now let's come to the main theorem I wanted to talk about. And that's joined with Simon Brandler. And Florian Yona. And basically, we are discussing this question in higher dimensions. And what we prove is the following, that there's no positive M intermediate curvature on M and minus M cross the M for N less or equal to seven. Okay, so basically this in particular implies both here three M one and two in dimension less or equal than seven. And I would also like to mention that here, Topologically, we, you don't just have to be M cross some torus, but you can also allow for like much more general space. So it's been so suffice if you have a non zero degree map onto this manifold. So in particular, you can allow connected sums, etc. And then the second thing, um, this bond of N less equal than seven is sharp. In fact, there are common examples constructed by Cashew. So this result is false for N greater equal than eight. I think I'm going to leave it at this. Thanks very much. Any questions? Yeah, all right. Since I like negative curvature, <laughs> I was in the beginning with my negative. <laughs> that if you have a manifold with negative sectional curvature, the Euler characteristic has to be of a particular size. Is that still open? Um, you know, but like for like the, for this of conjecture, it's basically whether the whether one no, can find a positive curvature. But there are like also like other conjectures due to Hopf, yeah. and quite a few of them are still quite nice slow. Which is from the angle of Gauss for a higher dimension model. That if you have negative sectional curvature in the surface, then you have to be or the characteristic or the genus is greater than two, right? There's a higher dimensional version of that which he made. That um. 
Is any do you know if there's any progress on that? Uh, I, I'm not sure about what happened in this direction. Any more questions? So is that n equals seven connected to the minimal surface? Oh, that's a great question. Um, what is it so like actually, it appears four times. Um, so we're basically using uh, minimal slices in our proof, which are like iterated minimal surfaces or weighted minimal surfaces. So that appears once because we need a regularity. Um, but basically, but then that appears in three different estimates. Um, so we, so basically, it's like a stability argument, and that we need to make some estimates. And at three places, um, we this constant also appears. So it appears sort of similar, like when one tries to prove regularity for minimal surfaces, where this co-dimension seven appears. And basically, the reason is also similar that the stability inequality you get is good a square term, and basically on each of the each dimension, and the higher the dimension goes, the less powerful the a square term is because it has to compete against like curvature terms, etc. So it's kind of like what you get when you're proving Simon Steele essentially. That's what it's, it's. It's pretty similar, like more precisely what you actually. That, so once you get the n less or equal than seven, the other one is more precisely n times m minus two is less or equal than m squared minus two. This is the condition which appears three times. Um, but if one plugs in different values for m, for instance, m equal to three, then we'll just have here n times one is less or equal than three squared minus two, which is seven, and the same for m equal to four. But for some m's, it allows for greater dimension. So okay. it's so it's like a conjecture that for this result, you just need to assume this. Maybe there are like some direct methods which can prove that. And how is it read? So like. What is the counter? What is the counter? Uh, is that n greater than or equal to eight? Then? Equal to. That's uh, it should be the other, other direction. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. And what's the counter example? Yeah. Um, basically, um, you take like here the round sphere times the torus and then take like a doubly warped product of a well chosen function on it. And, um, and it works exactly if the spawn is not satisfied anymore. Uh, but it does not seem to be related to the fact that there is the Simon's call in some way. Uh, or is it? Um, uh, uh, it's, it's like different, but sort of it comes also like in like st analyzing stability and inequalities. Yes? Does this uh, theorem three have any physical implications of the Big Bang? <laughs> uh, that would be really nice. Unfortunately, we don't um, know of any cases where, where this intermediate curvature appears. Yes. Well, the question is in, in dimension four, what happens for K3 surfaces? Um, so, on, so on dimension four, basically, the, the new ingredient um, would be that you don't have, say, positive two intermediate curvature whenever you have like this like T2 component. Um, so for like so for like K3 surfaces, um, that should should be already you can also do I think with easier methods.